Today what we're going to try to do is understand a driven harmonic oscillator when it's driven by a sinusoidal term in as much generality as possible. So let's start with only having parameters, no actual numbers, right? So we have the second derivative of y <coughs> plus the damping constant p times the first derivative of y plus the spring constant q times y and we're going to drive with a sinusoidal force so we're going to have cosine and then I'm going to put omega t. Okay, looking at this equation we have three parameters. All right? We have P, we have Q, and we have Omega. And they're all positive. Okay, uh, P is positive because it's a damping constant. Negative P wouldn't make a uh, physical sense, nor would a negative Q. That would be a spring that pushes in the direction that you're pulling it if Q was negative, so Q is positive, and omega we take to be positive because cosine is an even function, so it doesn't matter if omega is positive or negative. Only the absolute value of omega matters. Now, we know that this differential equation is going to have a particular solution that looks like this. It's going to be equal to A times cosine of omega t plus v. And I'll explain what a and v are for a second. Okay, now you might object, why do we know that cosine is going to be the answer, right? Because sometimes we get a sine out of it. But remember, if we change the phase of cosine, we can get sine, or change this phase of sine, we can get cosine. So cosine is general enough. Um, and our a, of course, is the amplitude of our solution. And this phi is called the phase angle. And this is sometimes called the steady state solution. Because as time goes on, the homogeneous, or the solutions that come from the homogeneous equation exponentially decay. And so this is the, the equation that matters for large amounts of time. That this is the part of the solution that matters. So what we could do is we could work through the whole problem with general P, Q, and omega and figure out what A and phi are. Now this is done and can be done and you can find it in most textbooks, but I'm not going to spend the time on that. I'm just going to write down the formulas for these numbers. The amplitude can be given solely in terms of P, Q, and omega. And the amplitude is equal to 1 divided by the square root of the quantity q minus omega squared squared plus p squared omega squared. So that's what a is. And similarly, we can write what phi is. I'm not going to write what phi is. I'm going to write what the tangent of phi is. The tangent of phi can be shown to be negative p omega divided by q minus omega squared. Put that in parentheses and make sure that we see we're dividing by that whole quantity. Okay. Now, in terms of the steady state solution, the phi, we probably don't care very much about it, right? Because that's only about where the steady state solution starts. Right? The, the phi doesn't matter. That's just a shift left or right of the solution. The amplitude of the solution, that's what we would care a lot about in terms of applications because we would want to know how big of a response we're going to get in our system. And the amplitude tells us how big a response. So what we want to do is we want to examine this part, this amplitude, right? Now this is a function of three variables, so that becomes hard to visualize. But if we fix one of the variables and switch the other two, we could, you know, look at a picture then. Um, so let's think about what's going on here. Um, 
we have this, the variables are only in the bottom. So when the variables P, well, when the quantity Q minus omega is small, or the quantity P squared minus omega squared is small, that's going to tend to make our A larger. So let's take a look at a picture of this in Wolfram Alpha. This is that same function there, q minus omega squared squared plus p squared times q squared. I'm just going to fix q, the string constant, or the spring constant to be 2. Okay, we got, we're going to fix one variable and look at the other two. And then I've plotted what we get out of this by letting p, the damping constant, go from 0 to 2, and omega the driving force, uh, the driving force is uh, frequency constant going from 0 to 4. And we see that we're getting this bump here. Where is this bump occurring? Well, this bump is occurring when P is small. When the damping gets smaller and smaller, when there's less and less damping, we, get this, we can get this spike in here. And where is this spike occurring? Well, it looks like a number between 1 and 2. Q is equal to 2. So going here, a number between 1 and 2 that would be important for omega to be when q is equal to 2 would be root 2. If omega was root 2, then q minus omega squared is 0. And then if omega stays at root 2 and we let p go to 0, this would blow up. And that's what we're seeing right here. We're seeing this singularity forming right here. So when your frequency that you're driving at, when the square of omega is close to q, you get large amplitudes out. Okay? Now, when the damping is small, you can sometimes even get small amplitudes out, as we see over here. When the damping is zero, even if the damping is zero, if omega is three or four, we're not getting a large amplitude out. It's only when we drive at the particular frequency that's related to the spring constant related by q equals omega squared. That's when we get large amounts of amplitude coming out for even a damped spring.